Uh, if you'd be inclined to do so, open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5. Make wise choices. As parents, uh, grandparents, teachers, and mentors, have you had multiple occasions to offer that counsel to our children, grandchildren, students, others who might be under our guidance? Make wise choices. You know, when you think about it, there are so many applications for offering such advice. Uh, we live in a very health-conscious society, and so we hear it frequently as it relates to diet. Make wise choices. Uh, just the other day, I picked up my granddaughter from soccer practice, and so she said she was thirsty, stopped by a convenience store on the way back to her house, gave her a few dollars, and when she came back out, she had a sports drink and a bag of chips. And she got in the car and I said, ah, didn't make a wise choice, did you? To which she responded, I'll eat wisely at supper. End of conversation. You know how that goes. But anyways, we, we certainly see its application as it relates to diet. Make wise choices. I'm sure we've had occasion to encourage our children to do that when it came to selecting friends. Age appropriate, when they were deciding whom they would date, eventually choosing whom they would marry. Make wise choices. I'm sure uh, guidance counselors offer that a lot with regards to a career path and even for job selection. Make wise choices. Sometimes it has to do with just daily, you know, routines. Uh, make wise choices as to how you're going to spend your time today. Again, I, I know I use my grandchildren a lot by way of illustrations, but, you know, so often I'll ask them if they've done something. They said, oh, I don't have time. What did you do today? And oh, I slept in until 11 and then, uh, you know, uh, played on my phone, watched TV. So you didn't have time. Uh, make wise choices. And then probably on a little bit more profound level, make wise choices as it regards to setting priorities for your life. And maybe we wouldn't word it this way, but certainly we would want to encourage young people to make wise choices when it comes to adopting a worldview. Uh, that uh, terminology is becoming more and more in in vogue today, and it, it speaks to a specific perspective through eyes, how you're going to see the world, a, a standpoint a, that serves, if you will, as then the constitution by which you are going to make so many fundamental decisions in your life, govern factors like your belief system, your values, your morality, make wise choices. I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful that such counsel is regularly heard by youngsters because they will face so many decisions in those formative years. Now, it's one thing to offer advice to young people. It's another thing for them to heed it. <laughs> and so maybe in an effort to encourage them actually to heed the advice, make wise choices, we might find ourselves emphasizing the importance of doing that because choices bring consequences. You know, this relationship between choices and consequences is hopefully something that we have instilled and inculcated into the thinking of young people at a pretty early age. And if so, then we can kind of draw upon this inseparable relationship, inescapable relationship. Choices bring consequences. And we can try to impress upon children, grandchildren, students, that making wise choices will bring favorable consequences. But on the other hand, 
carelessly, thoughtlessly, sometimes foolishly, making important decisions often brings unfavorable consequences. Often consequences that come with regrets. That's why I brought you to Proverbs 5. Proverbs 5 gives us a Bible illustration, if you will, a real life example of that. Because as you may know, here in these early chapters of Proverbs, we have Solomon, now King Solomon, endowed with this extraordinary wisdom from God, promoting that wisdom. And it would appear, at least among his children, his sons, daughters, maybe in a, in a family devotional, or, or maybe on a broader scale, he, he's speaking of the children of Israel, like his children. But however we might, See the context. Listen, listen to the advice. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 1 My son, attend unto my wisdom. Bow thine ear to my understanding. Why, Solomon? Why? That, here's the reason, that thou mayest regard discretion and that thy lips may keep knowledge. Now, from that general encouragement to listen, take heed, be wise in the decisions you make. He's going to offer one particular application of that, much like what we were suggesting. This has to do with avoiding immoral people, promiscuous women, particularly as mentioned here by Solomon. Stay away. Wisdom demands keeping far from them. Don't let them ensnare you. Don't let them seduce you. Don't let them take you on a road that leads to destruction. Now, we're not going to read that part. I want us to come down to what would happen what would happen if hearing the council make wise choices as it relates to this, his sons, his daughters, his children, whoever it might be, wouldn't listen? What if they refuse to exercise wise choices in this matter? Listen to what he says. Verse 10, lest strangers be filled with your wealth and your labors be in the house of a stranger and thou mourn at the last. When thy flesh and thy body are consumed and you say, how have I hated instruction and my heart disobeyed or despised reproof. I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers nor incline mine ear to them that instructed me. Do you hear those words of regret? Here is now somebody who didn't listen to the wise counsel and having foolishly chosen differently, now they're looking back, now they're seeing the consequences and they're saying, how foolish I was. My father urged me, listen, be wise. And I chose not to do it. It's as though I hated knowledge. I despised reproof. And now I'm suffering the consequences. Friends, these unfavorable consequences from making unwise choices can be very far reaching. Can be very long lasting. Now, hopefully we would reason with our, our kids, our grandchildren, our students, make wise choices because choices have consequences. But you know what I have discovered as a father, now as a grandfather, sometimes you can't really rationalize with kids. <laughs> you try, you try. So maybe, maybe an emotional appeal can be coupled with this. 
We're trying to promote their heeding the advice. Make wise choices by helping them to understand the choices that you make now will have consequences that might have very long lasting effect in your life. But maybe we can strengthen the reasoning by assuring our children, grandchildren, students that the motive behind urging you to do this is love. We're not trying to irritate you. We're not trying to aggravate you. We're not trying to annoy you by constantly saying, make wise choices. They roll their eyes. They say, they chuckle. But try, try. We try to implore them to recognize. The reason for this repeated counsel is because we want your best. We love you. Maybe from our own experiences, we're trying to keep you from experiencing those bad consequences, from making unwise choices. Now, I say all that. Because I think we would agree. Such parental counsel, make wise choices, is regularly heard in emotionally healthy physical families. That being acknowledged, question, would we not expect similar advice to be heard from our Heavenly Father? You know, our Creator. You know, that perfect Father whose love for His children, us, eclipses the greatest love that we could possibly have as earthly parents and grandparents for our children and grandchildren. That Heavenly Father. You think He would urge His children make Wise choices. You know, again, the architect of life, who in ordaining this earthly life is the one who established this immutable principle, choices bring consequences. He's the one who put that law in place. He's the one who established that law. Wouldn't we expect him to urge us make wise choices? Hopefully all of us would readily agree that our Heavenly Father does in fact urge us repeatedly make wise choices. In fact, it is such divine counsel that is at the very heart of our current series of sermons that we have entitled Choosing Wisdom, Make Wise Choices. One of the reasons is because that will prevent introducing misery into our lives. Now, we have derived this title, this series, this concept from Ecclesiastes chapter 8. We won't want to spend all of our time reviewing, but invite you back there, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, at the end of verse 5 again, a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment, because to every purpose there is time and judgment, therefore the misery of man is great upon him. And so we set out, you know, basically the, the thesis of this. Solomon speaks about misery that is great upon man. Well, we invite that into our lives by choosing not to adopt and to live by true wisdom, which is to listen to our Father, our Heavenly Father, that perfect Father, our Creator, the architect of life, when He says, this is how you ought to live your life. That's true wisdom. Now, again, we want to make practical application of that, and so there are there are countless, innumerable number of applications, but we thought we would stay right there in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 because Solomon introduces some great ones. You, by choosing wisdom, you'll prevent misery by accepting authority. We also talked about choosing wisdom will prevent misery by expecting an end. And when we were last together, 
we were observing and kind of elaborating upon choosing, choosing wisdom will prevent misery by preparing for perplexities. Preparing for perplexities. Now, hopefully, we have well established the reality that perplexities will be experienced in the process of our living under the sun. A recurring phrase in the book of Ecclesiastes as it identifies this life under the sun. We, those present, have lived long enough, except for maybe Elena, but we, we obviously have lived long enough to experience this reality. We're going to encounter some perplexities. But notice... Hopefully we've shown that, and, and we even talked last week about perplexities that were experienced by individuals that we would no doubt esteem as very spiritually minded people, like Solomon, like Job, like Asaph, like Habakkuk, one of God's prophets. They encountered situations in life that left them perplexed. Sometimes even asking questions of God and God's moral government and God's justice. Questions. So, I hope we well establish the fact that we're going to encounter perplexities, whoever we are. Regardless of our, our spiritual maturity. We're going to, again, either experience or witness things that are going to cause us to ask questions in this life. Troubling questions. But I want to call attention to the fact that we said choosing wisdom will prevent misery by preparing for perplexities. See, that's part of true wisdom. It is preparing for it. Now, certainly that preparation would include anticipating the fact that these perplexities are going to come, that are going to have us asking those questions, but I think more has to be involved in the preparation. I looked up the word prepare, Ricky, and, and here are some of the definitions, some of the concepts that were suggested. Quote, to make ready beforehand for some purpose. I like this one. To put in a proper state of mind. I mentioned that because preparing for perplexities, I would suggest, is advocating that true wisdom necessitates readying our mind for their coming. Not just knowing that they're going to come, but ready our minds for when they do come. And therefore adopt a proper way of thinking. So that when we do encounter these perplexities, which we will, listen to me please, they will not cause us to doubt God. They will not cause our faith, our trust in God to be undermined. Oh, sure, these perplexities will come. They will prompt questions, sometimes questions that we would want to pose to God. But our prepared thinking will not allow those perplexities nor the questions they prompt regardless of how troubling they are, regardless of how befuddling they are, how probing they are, they will not foster doubt in our God. Friends, we need to prepare our minds so that when we encounter perplexities in life, they will not cause us to relinquish our faith in God, to doubt God, Doubt God's goodness, doubt God's justice, doubt God's wisdom, doubt God's love. They just will not call, allow us to doubt God. Nor preparing for perplexities should also have us mentally, emotionally, spiritually prepared so that when we do encounter those perplexities, they will not find us forfeiting the joy that God wants us to have here under the sun as his children. 
I really think that's what Solomon is recommending. I hope you're there in Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Uh, again, we've already read some of the perplexities that he was talking about, uh, verse 10, and so I saw the wicked buried who had come and gone from the place of the holy, and they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This is also vanity. Uh, again, look down at verse 14. There is a vanity which is done under the earth, or upon the earth, that there be just men, unto whom it happens according to the work of the wicked. And again, there be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I said that this is also vanity. He's seeing injustice is done. He, he's wondering how it is that the wicked seem to be prospering. How the, the righteous seem to be afflicted. How are we to understand that? How are we to see God's providence in that? Even Solomon, in all of his wisdom, he was perplexed. But look at his recommendation. Look at his recommendation of verse 15. Then I commended mirth. Because a man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry, for that shall abide with him of his labor the days of his life which God gives him under the sun. Now, now, please appreciate, this is not the only time that we're going to hear Solomon through the book of Ecclesiastes kind of offering that kind of recommendation. In fact, uh, let me ask you to back up. Look at uh, Ecclesiastes. I think the first one I want to look at is chapter 3. Look at verse 22. Wherefore I perceive, and, and again, he was talking about these injustices. Uh, he says, verse 16, and moreover, I saw under the sun the place of judgment, that wickedness was there, the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. When you get down to verse 22, wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his portion. For who shall bring him to see what shall be hereafter? I want to read quickly, and, and I'm, this is not a blanket endorsement of uh, the pulpit commentary. One I've had for um, many years, that's obvious. Uh, I actually got it as a wedding gift, just to tell you how long ago this was. And that was second-handed. Uh, but I want you to listen to what he says here uh, in, in his comments about this verse. The conclusion in verse 22 is connected with verses 16 through 18. We must acknowledge that there are disorders in the world which we cannot remedy and which God allows in order to demonstrate our powerlessness. Therefore, the wisest course is to make the best of present circumstances. Also, turn over to Ecclesiastes. Got to find out where I'm. Got my notes from here. Oh, this actually has to do with the text over in Ecclesiastes chapter eight. Let me again read these uh, comments by, uh, you know, the editors of of the pulpit commentary. Quote: He says, "In the face of the anomalies." which meet us in our, and he's talking about perplexities, in the face of these anomalies which we, which we meet, uh, which meet us in our view of life, Solomon recommends the calm enjoyment of such blessings and comforts as we possess. Now, watch what he offers by way of disclaimer. This is not a commendation of a greedy, voluptuous life. This is not Epicureanism. This is not saying, eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. That's not what is being promoted here. And I concur because he even talks about which God gives man. He says, this is not a commendation of a greedy, voluptuous life, but an injunction thankfully to enjoy the good provided by God without disquieting ourselves with the mysteries of providence. End of quote. I hope that helps. It helps me. It helps me. 
Another author said it this way, quote, don't spend a miserable life worrying about what the wicked seem to be getting away with. They will have to pay one day. And that introduces me to the next part of preparing ourselves. Because this wise response to perplexities, again, not allowing it to rob us of the joys that God intended for us to have and experience here under the sun. This wise response to perplexities is because we did prepare our hearts. We did ready ourselves beforehand we adopted a proper state of mind. And what is that? To recognize whatever's happening here on earth, number one, God is still in control. Number two, God witnesses and knows all about these situations that so perplex us. It's interesting, we looked at Habakkuk. Habakkuk is, is God's prophet. I mean, he's speaking by inspiration. And yet, Habakkuk in his heart is saying like, God, don't you see this? It's almost like God was somehow aloof from what was going on. Friends, we have to prepare our hearts. We have to prepare our minds for these perplexities, knowing that God is fully, completely, perfectly aware of all that's going on. And then finally, we can't so trouble ourselves with these things because, thirdly, we prepared our minds knowing that God will, in His time, in His own way, according to His purposes, judge all of these matters. You remember those three fundamental concepts we talked about from Ecclesiastes chapter 8? Time, judgment, and purpose. See, here they come into play in preparing our minds for meeting these perplexities. God will in time judge. Again, I want to read a few comments. Go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. We've got to do this quickly. Already past time. But Ecclesiastes chapter 3. You remember we read 22? Kind of like a, a conclusion. But look at how <laughs> look at how Solomon is, if you will, finding some quietness in his own perplexities. Look at what he says, verse 16, And moreover I saw under the sun the place of judgment, that wickedness was there, and the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. I said in my heart, here he's preparing himself, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time... There for every purpose and for every work. Did you see? Purpose, time, judgment. There they are again. Solomon's preparing himself and he says, you know, I've got perplexities. I've got questions. But here I prepared my mind. I know God will judge. Finally, look over in chapter 5. Look at chapter 5 and verse 8. This is great. <laughs> again, chapter 5 and verse 8. If thou seest the oppression of the poor and violent, perverting of judgment and justice in a province, listen to it, marvel not at the matter. Don't be so perplexed. Don't be so disquieted. Don't be so troubled by that. What helps in that? What, what allows you to have that kind of wisdom with regards to perplexities? For he that is higher than the highest, and there be higher than they. You know who he's talking about, right? You see all these injustices in, in the American judicial system, other court systems across the world. And Solomon says, you're going to see that. You're going to behold that. It's going to befell you. But don't be too troubled by it. 
because there is one who is higher than the highest earthly judge. We know who that is. We know who Solomon was referring to, right? Again, pulpit commentary. Over the highest of earthly rulers, there are other powers. God himself, who governs the course of this world and to whom we may leave the final adjustment. He goes on to say, this remedy is the thought of the supreme disposer of events, God, who holds all the strings in his hand and will in the end bring good out of evil. We don't have time to do this, but I wanted to go back to each of those. Solomon, Job, Asaph, and Habakkuk. If you go back there, you will find in the midst of their perplexities, in the midst of their asking questions, you know what eventually will quiet their troubled spirits? It is this preparation. What will Solomon say at the end of his conclusion on what is life all about? Hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Why? For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. Remember Job's perplexities? God takes him on a nature walk. And what does Job come to find out? He says, I know that you can do everything. There is no thought that can be withholden from thee. I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. <laughs> he had a renewed appreciation for who God is. That God's not missing what's going on in Job's life. And God is in control. What about Asaph? Asaph was nearing apostasy because he saw wicked people prospering. But then, then he wisely remembered God's perspective. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I their end. In fact, he's going to say, I was like a, I was like a brute beast. I, I was envying them. The prosperous in this world. When I should be remembering what their end is going to be. When God brings them into judgment. And the book of Habakkuk, this is too lengthy to help you with, but please read Habakkuk's thankful prayer at the end. Habakkuk's only three chapters. And the first two is about Habakkuk's questioning God. Why aren't you doing something? God tells him, I'm going to do something. He says, why are you doing it that way? At the end, just listen to this. Listen to this trust. Although the fig tree will not blossom, Neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail. The fields will yield no meat. The flock will be cut off from the fold. There will be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. And he will make my feet like hinds feet. He will make me to walk upon high places. Habakkuk said, I've got a new perspective. If the Chaldeans do come in and destroy everything, every source of food that God's people have, I will still rejoice in my God. What allowed Habakkuk to have a new look? He saw things differently. He prepared his heart to remember God is in control. God sees and knows it all. And God will eventually judge. Friends, let me just ask you this. Why would we not follow the very personification of wisdom? That's Jesus. Let me ask you, when Jesus lived under the sun, when he came to this earth in his incarnate form, was he ever troubled in his spirit? He was, wasn't he? On one occasion he said, Father, I don't know what to ask. The hour is approaching. Should I ask to be delivered? But that's why I came. When he goes to the garden, what's his prayer? Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But notice, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. 
Let's follow the example of our Savior. Perfect personification of wisdom. You know what he does when he's troubled? He prays. And his prayer is, Father, let me yield my will to yours because I don't know all that's going on. And when Peter is offering advice to servants, Christian slaves who are suffering at the hand, unjustly suffering at the hands of wicked masters, you know what he says? Why don't you look to Jesus? He's the one you're following. What did he do? When he was reviled, he didn't revile again. When he suffered, he didn't threaten. You know what he did? He committed himself to him that judges righteously. Brother Woods made a great comment, quote, Though being greatly wronged by man, Jesus would receive righteous judgment at the hands of the Father. Isn't that the preparation we need to make? We're not always going to be treated right by man. But let us commit our souls to the Father who will always do right. Friends, choosing not to follow this wisdom is to invite misery into our lives. As we encounter those inevitable perplexities that will trouble us, we're going to feel out of control. We're going to feel like we have no answers, no recourse, other than just to be miserable about the things over which we have no say. I alluded to this earlier, but let me just conclude with this personally, personally. I'm acquainted very well with a once faithful Christian who was perplexed, troubled about why God did not address a very troubling set of circumstances in their life according to their prayers according to their perceived way that God should have addressed this, according to their timetable. And sadly, those perplexities foster distrust in their God. To, the po to possibly this extent, I don't know because I can't judge people's hearts, but I believe now that person no longer even believes in God. They've gone back to the world. They've apostatized. All because they failed to wisely prepare for these inevitable perplexities that we're going to encounter in life. And this was a real one. This was troubling, even to hear about it, let alone to experience it. But friends, it's sad. Because this misery that this individual invited into their lives was preventable. By choosing the wisdom of God's counsel. Prepare for this. They're going to come. Sometimes you're not going to be able to resolve them. Sometimes you're not going to know the right timetable. But don't doubt God. Don't question His goodness. Don't question His love, His wisdom, His justice. And certainly don't question His existence. Injustices, perceived inequalities, uncertainties to the role of God's providence in life's affairs can trouble us. They can bring perplexities even to the most spiritually minded individuals. But here's what our Father says. Make wise choices. Make wise choices.